Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions, and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. Quick history lesson as context for today. When we think about equal rights, in particular, the fight for women's suffrage or the right for women to vote. You know, in school, we learn about women like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, people who are early figures in the movement. But a lot of us don't really realize, especially those of us who, like me, are not the best at history, names, dates, places, all that kind of stuff. But that movement lasted over a century. It was multiple generations of women fighting for that right. And in the end, it was Alice Paul who was the woman who led the charge that successfully got the 19th Amendment passed in 1920, which was 70 years later, giving women the right to vote across the U.S. So my guest today, I'm very excited to, to introduce to you, is Allison Tipman. And Allison is the executive director of the Alice Paul Institute, continuing the fight, working for gender equality and leadership development. Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. I'm really excited to talk to you today. So I just gave a little bit of history, but tell us from your perspective, uh, tell us a little about the Alice, excuse me, about the Alice Paul Institute. What's the 30 second elevator pitch that you have for us? The Alice Paul Institute develops the female leaders of tomorrow and educates the public about the history of the women's suffrage movement, connecting the history of the suffrage movement to modern effort, efforts around gender equality. And we do that because of our namesake, Alice Paul. As you said, she was pivotal to gaining women the right to vote in 1920. But Alice was actually a lifelong crusader for gender equality. After she successfully helped to pass the 19th Amendment, she moved forward doing things like writing the Equal Rights Amendment, forming the World Women's Party, and otherwise traveling the country and the world, being incredibly influential in gaining women additional rights. Today, we are inspired by her legacy to train the next generations of Alice Pauls, to help the girls of today find the leadership role models they need to find their voices and to create positive change in their communities. We also work to make the history of the suffrage movement and ensuing efforts around gender equality accessible and educational for everyone. That's great. I love the idea of helping girls find their voice find their voice. There's so many, look, that's, that's my whole world is helping people find their voice. So I'm glad we get to do that together. Now with all that, that you get to do, what's your favorite part of your job and why? My favorite part of my job always is the people. It's really other people who inspire me when the work feels challenging and whether that's my staff, um, having a brainstorm and coming up with some amazing idea for a new program, my board of directors who really understands how we work to connect the history of the suffrage movement to what's happening today and puts the resources we need behind it. Our visitors, the people who attend our virtual program, um, the people who are really inspired by Alice Paul and by other women who are part of the suffrage movement and are working to move those efforts forward. There's so much in there. I, I want to look ahead. We were talking right before the before we began our, our interview today that it's been, it, last year was the 100 year, the, the centennial celebration of that right to vote from 1920 to 2020. And of course the pandemic threw a nice big bucket of water on celebration opportunities, but what's coming up now? What's looking ahead? What's a big uh, item of importance or issue you're focusing on or, or something that you're building? And how does your communication around that have to really be focused and on point? So I, I'm trying to find the bright spots within the pandemic. And yeah. one of them is that the suffrage centennial surfaced really amazing research, scholarship, writing, and communication about the stories that hadn't been told. As you noted in the beginning, we learn a little bit about the suffrage movement in school, and it's generally about early white suffragists. Mm -hmm. And there was so much more to the suffrage movement and the movement for gender equality than just a few white women working in the 19th century. So what we're working to do here is continue that effort to broaden the story, to talk about people who were involved and influential so that people can see themselves in those figures, can mm. find role models and can get a broader sense of the story than they might have been taught in school. 
And in, in what kinds of initiatives are you putting forward to help people see themselves in those suffragists? So the, it's early days for us on this road. Okay. We're working to provide more programming that highlights different figures within the suffrage movement. Alice Paul is certainly our namesake and one of our inspirations, but we have inspiration beyond Alice. So even recently, we've done programs on topics like uh, figures who today would identify or be identified as LGBTQ, who were hmm. part of the women's suffrage movement. We're working to bring more stories of the Black women who are involved in the suffrage movement to the fore. I have a picture of Ida B. Wells Barnett behind me mm. because she was really influential in a broad swath of social movements at the time, including suffrage. Downstairs, below my office in our exhibit, we just installed a new banner about Ida B. Wells Barnett and the other Black women who participated mm. in a really important 1913 suffrage march. There was a lot of controversy around their participation, but they participated anyway. And we want to make sure that people understand the role that they played in that day and in the broader movement. And in so I think it's interesting that we're both trying to expand the view with regard to understanding who really was part of that and how there were so many other groups. And one of the other things that you were talking to me about earlier was the, the stretch into virtual and hybrid programming, that this is something that, of course, you know, we all got thrown into the all virtual all the time world um, 18 months ago, give or take. But I think it's different for organizations like yours uh, just because of the the nature of the kinds of programs that you have had traditionally offered versus mm -hmm. your the scope the stretch that you now have not being limited to just what's a walk in per se how has that tell us about that transformation how have you learned to to go with that and to leverage to find that that silver lining as you said earlier I have to give a lot of credit to my staff. By the time I got to this position in January, they had really already figured out what worked for our organization in terms of online programming and put a lot of effort into adapting our programming to the virtual space. Mm -hmm. As you noted, previously our efforts were focused on site. Our programs for kids were about touring the site and getting a hands-on experience. And that's just not possible in the virtual world. So we've had to explore what it takes to have an impactful online program. One of the things that has worked is in broadening the stories. We have been able to invite presenters from all over the country and sometimes the world to partner with us to offer presentations. So that's allowed us to take on new topics. We did a program on the state of women's voting rights around the world with presenters from as far away as Australia. Oh, wow. And that's not something we ever would have been able to do before. Now, as we start to move towards doing some on-site programming, we're exploring the technology we need to make our programs accessible, both on-site and online, because we don't want to lose this reach that we've gained during the pandemic, sure. with this move to virtual programming. It's really exciting to have people from across the country and the world learn more about the Alice Paul Institute and want to get engaged with our programs. Have you gotten any good feedback or stories about who you've inspired somewhere else in the world? Uh, we have a flagship program called the Girls Leadership Council. It's been mm. going on for years. It's, it's expanded from something like five girls in its first year to 95 girls. Wow. And previously they were local because they met in person here. Um, as of last year with the move to virtual, we picked up attendees from as far away as California. Okay. And this year, we have attendees from at least six states, and we're hoping to keep growing that. Every year, the evaluations from those programs show that over 90% of the girls participating feel that they've increased really key things like their self-confidence, their leadership skills, their understanding of what female role models exist for them as they're thinking about who they are and how they might want to lead. So it's exciting that we were able to not just continue our core programming, but make it more broadly accessible and bring in girls from across the country who find it valuable. That's so exciting, especially because there are, obviously when it's only a site-based program, if you're not going to happen to walk across the street and be able to, to access the door, you don't get to access the content and to know that you're inspiring 
girls to say, I can do this. These are, there are role models out there who think like me, who look like me, et cetera, that that's, uh, that just makes my heart happy to hear those kinds of things. Now in building these programs and in reaching so many different people, what are some of the communication skills that you have that you're really good at? And what do you wish you were better at? I tend to um, ascribe to the like move quickly and break things philosophy, <laughs> okay. especially, especially now I feel like we have to be so responsive to our community and what our community needs and wants that we just have to be willing to try different things. And that's across the board, but definitely with our communication strategies. So we find ourselves relying much more perhaps on social media when previously we would have been seeing more people in person. We're not handing out flyers about our events. We're putting them on our website and then on um, multiple social media channels. And I think it can be challenging for the audiences who know us from before to move with us as we try out new Mm. things. So I'm always working to think through the process of engaging the stakeholders I need to, to making sure people don't feel like we're leaving them out or leaving them behind as we're trying to see what it's going to take to um, to meet new audiences and to bring more people in and expand our message to as many people as possible. Who would feel like you're leaving them behind? That's interesting. Well, I think if you think about the people who traditionally have followed women's history and the women's suffrage movement, it's a community that has varying levels of comfort with technology and especially with social media. So we have programs with and for teenage girls. So we find that we have to be present on Instagram. We're talking to the girls about whether we should start a TikTok. (laughs) But for the audience that has stayed with us since our founding in 1984, that's not necessarily where they're looking for their information. Right. We don't have a huge staff. Our capacity is limited. So we have to think carefully about where we're focusing and where we're putting our resources But again, make sure that no one who wants to get the message isn't able to. Got it. Got it. So in doing all that, and I completely appreciate the move quickly, break things, just trial and error, see, throw it against the wall, see what sticks and and learn from Mm -hmm. your mistakes and move on. What are you personally really good at? I think I'm a really transparent and clear communicator. I don't try to hide anything. I try to be as open as possible at all times because I feel like authenticity is important. It helps people to trust you if they know that you're not holding back from them, if they can count on you to tell them what you think they need or want to know. Um, I think the flip side of that, like I noted, is that I'm not always the most patient communicator. So that's something I'm always working to improve, to make sure in my efforts to move fast and break things that I'm still taking the time to listen to people who need to be heard. What are some of the hardest communication areas to be patient on or, or what it, how does that manifest, I should say? Oh, that's a tough question. Because those are patient, people think about patience mm-hmm. as one thing and then as communication as another. And I love that you brought them together. What does patient communication look like or sound like? Or where would it need to, to come into play? Where should people start to think about, am I a patient communicator? versus do, am I just a patient person? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think I can pull on my days, actually being the one in a museum, giving the tours, doing the program delivery. Um, I'm by nature a fast talker. I just get excited and enthusiastic and I'll start spitting out facts and telling stories. And what I have learned is how to take a breath When I ask people if they have questions, I need to mean it and I need to leave space afterwards for them to actually ask questions, like give people a moment, don't rush through it. And I think that can be hard if you don't feel like you're a natural public speaker and you're just trying to like muscle through the experience, but I think it helps you and your audience if you can take a breath and give them time to digest what you've said and ask their questions. It's, it's 
interesting because in my former life, many, many moons ago, a couple of decades, at the very least, uh, I taught public school. And one of the things, and from there, I ended up training teachers for a while. And one of the things that was always hardest to get into teachers' heads, my own being the first one that had to get it into, and then everybody else's was what was called wait time. And it's exactly what you just described, that idea of when you're going to ask a question, regardless of to whom, right, people, uh, tourists, people on a, on a tour of, a, of, an, of an organization, of a location, students in a classroom, people in a meeting, if you're going to ask a question, the, then it becomes how long do you wait for someone to volunteer an answer before you either repeat the question, paraphrase the question, give options, multiple choice, or otherwise answer the question yourself and move on. And most people assume that they wait. Usually they would, most people would say, I probably wait five to 10 seconds before I take some step myself. And we would have the people go and back to their classrooms with and record themselves teaching a lesson and then go back with the timer and see how long that they could measure that they actually did wait before between the initial question and when they then answered for themselves or otherwise. And it was usually about one and a half seconds was about the average. And we're so bad. We just assume we give people plenty of time and we just don't. And it's really no different whether you're in corporate America or a classroom or someplace like the Alice Paul Institute. So I'm so glad you brought that up and the notion of being, I love how you phrase it, being a patient communicator and using that wait time. So we're going to challenge, I'm going to take the moment and challenge everybody out there, record yourself in a meeting or catch, go play back some Zoom meeting that got recorded and that you led. If you asked a question, how long did you wait? before you filled in your own blank. So thank you for that segue. It's so important. Silence is by far the most underrated, underutilized uh, rhetorical device in all of speech. So it's so, so important. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight that. So who are some of your role models besides Alice Paul, of course, but uh, communication wise, who's been someone you looked up to and admired? I love that you brought up educators and that that's your background, Laura. I have had so many wonderful educators in my life that I really give them a lot of credit for where I am in the work that I do. I feel like I'm an educator in a different way. And it's because of the teachers and professors that I had who were such great communicators um, that I was inspired by the history that I learned from them. And some of my educators, it really went beyond content into communication style and personality. Uh, And one professor in particular springs to mind. I went to Barnard College in New York, which is a women's college affiliated with Columbia University, a co-ed school. And I remember being in a freshman year anthropology seminar, which was a class of about 100 people, and Professor Paige West stopping in the middle of her lesson and saying, excuse me, everyone, why aren't the women in this class raising their hands? Why is it that at Barnard College, it is only the male students who are answering my questions? That's not what this learning environment is about. I encourage everyone to be forthcoming with answers. And she said she knew that we knew the material. She just felt that we needed that reminder that we were in a space that was really based around the empowerment of women. And as a freshman in that environment, it really helped me to understand the place I had come to. I appreciate what I was going to experience over the next four years. And Barnard was absolutely influential in my development as a leader, especially as a female leader. I love that. Uh, Can I, is it fair for me to lovingly classify that little uh, invitation as a loving kick in the pants? I think that's absolutely fair. I don't think Professor West would have any problem with that characterization. (laughs) I think we really all need that every now and then. I know I certainly do. And a little bit of tough love. And it doesn't even sound like that was that tough. It was just a little, just enough of a chastisement to say, you know, aren't you here for something? What are you here for? Take it. I'm offering it to you. And you're going, no, that's okay. Give it to someone else. Sit up and take the space that you deserve to claim. Answer and ask questions accordingly. So to everybody out there, especially women, take your space, answer questions when you have the opportunity, participate fully and ask questions too. There's no such thing as a dumb question. The worst ones are the ones that are left unasked has been at least Mm -hmm. my experience 99.9% of the time. Uh, So thank you so much for bringing that up and giving credit to your professor. Now, what about style shifting and getting used to different 
types of audiences. Have you had to learn to adjust your speaking style when you're addressing different groups in order to be as effective? I definitely have had to flex my communication skills based on audiences. Again, I used to give presentations and tours and had to be able to pick up signals, body language, actual communication, whatever it was to try to gauge whether my audience was listening, what they were going to respond to, and how I was going to be able to effectively get my message across. And that skill has served me well. I have been here at the Alice Paul Institute since January. Currently, our staff and board are all female. I came here from the American Helicopter Museum Mm -hmm. with a board that was predominantly male and predominantly made up of aviation engineers. And I don't ascribe to gender essentialism. I don't think people are defined by by their gender, but those two groups worked very differently. They communicated differently. Um, They absorbed facts and figures and stories differently, and they responded to the way that I communicated information differently. Um, So I've really enjoyed moving from one space into the other and thinking about what communication skills I need to draw on based on the space that I'm in. I would imagine that as a, a uh, grossly, un, what's the right word? Uh, I think it is probably an understatement how you classified the distinction between going from a, a room full of primarily male engineers to a nonprofit and, and working in women's. Are, are most of the people at the Institute, most of your employees, are they women? Yes, the yes, staff strictly. is currently all female, as is the board. That's okay. not that's not necessarily true all the time. That's not a rule around here, but at Just the moment, to be. that's where we are. Sure. And I really appreciate um, that that it's a space for open communication. I feel mm-hmm. like amongst our group, everyone really welcomes broad participation, tries to listen to each other, tries to welcome everyone's voice and diverse participation, and takes people from kind of where they are coming from a helicopter museum, being the person (laughs) in the room who didn't know anything about helicopters. It was a different kind of space and experience. So how did you, given that you were the only non-engineer in the room and you didn't have all that technical experience, how did you connect with them differently from when you took over the executive director role at the Alice Paul Institute? What did you have to do differently? Well, fortunately, I was very honest in my interview at the Helicopter Museum about what I did and didn't know about this, the topic area. So from the beginning, I came in being open about my lack of technical knowledge about aviation, but I invited people to teach me. I had volunteers who were pilots and mechanics and um, people who had 30 and 40 and 50 years of hands-on experience. And I thought it was really fun to let them talk to me and show me something that they were so passionate and so knowledgeable about. And that turned out to be a really good strategy. They appreciated the humility with which I approached the topic, that I didn't try to pretend I knew things I didn't. And they appreciated that I um, understood their expertise and really valued it. And that made them feel more connected to the institution and just really welcomed in the space. And they in turn welcomed me there. And then how was the the way that you connected with them different from how you connected with this particular group at the Alice Paul Institute? Well, again, from the beginning here, I was very honest with them that I'm, I'm pretty sure if someone told me to write down the description of my dream job, this would be it. Hmm. It combines my interest in uh, nonprofit management with my history in museums and my academic experiences in women's studies. So from the beginning, I told everyone this brings together everything I love. This is what I know about these things. Tell me what you know about these things. Um, So trying to swap expertise and swap stories and find out how, how, when, and why people got engaged with the Alice Paul Institute. Mm. What is it uh, about our mission and message around gender equality that resonates with them? And then absorbing that and taking that into account when I think about how we're going to move forward into the future. Nice, nice. And I, I want to draw attention back to something that you said earlier, the, that people appreciated the humility that you used in the beginning and recognizing that they had certain expertise that you don't. I think it's important to qualify that I, I'm going to guess and tell me if I'm wrong here, but in presenting that humility, that there was a confidence behind it as opposed to an apologetic humility. And I think this is something that people 
forget that humility is something that people respond positively to when you're confident in your space, standing your ground and saying, you know what, this is a place where you have more knowledge than I do. Share that with me. As opposed to being, oh yeah, you're right. I actually don't have a lot of experience in that. And, you know, but I'm kind of hoping you don't really realize it or that there's that imposter syndrome that can come out, et cetera. And, and there's a whole lot behind that term, obviously, but uh, just to the extent that in acknowledging someone else's expertise or one's own lack, that it's so you can't be expected to be an expert in everything and to just have that humility in a way that's unapologetic. I think a lot of women in particular are not good at marrying those two things. They can be humble, but in kind of an embarrassed and sheepish way. And the ability to stand firm in that without the apology is something that breeds trust as opposed to concern. Um, am I summarizing that right? But I Definitely. I completely agree. I think I could come into that place with that humility because I'm also at a point in my career, in my life as a person where I know what my expertise is and I know how valuable it is. So I have deep expertise in museum management. I know a lot about history, even if it's not helicopter history. So I came into that space still being confident in being its leader and being its executive director, but being able to say, this is the one area I don't know. Can you help teach me so that I can be a better executive director for this place right here, right now, knowing that I already have the expertise I need in the financial management, in the collections management, in how to welcome visitors to our institution. And I, I think that's a benefit of moving further in your career in gaining skills and expertise that then gives you confidence. And it, it's definitely a challenge as a woman I would not claim that I feel totally comfortable in every space I go into professionally, even now, but I know that I feel more confident than I did earlier in my career. Yes, yes. And it's always a learning curve for, for all of us and new context can breed new insecurities one way or another, but just to, to stand strong in that humility, I think is terrific. And that brings us to the listener 24 hour influence challenge. This is your opportunity, Allison, to talk directly to our audience and challenge everyone to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? So I wanna tie it to the conversation we just had. I would like to challenge everyone to ask someone to teach them something. Oh. It could be something professional, it could be something personal, but approach someone with that spirit of humility, admit that you don't know something and would like to, and ask them if they will show you how to do it. Love it. Okay. So it could be about how to cook something. It could be about how to code something. It could be about how to build something, whatever it happens to be, ask them to share their expertise with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and see how that builds your relationship with them as well as your understanding of whatever it is you get to learn. Love it. Okay. So it does not just have to be at work. It could be, but again, relationships are relationships and people are people. And it's always helpful to develop them from there. Now let's talk about, we've been discussing some of your successes. Let's talk about some of the mistakes along the way, because much as we'd love to think that we're all perfect and don't have any, inevitably, we all make one or two along the way. So can you share with us a communication mistake that you made along the way? Laura, I'm not perfect. What? <laughs> well, I'm assuming you are, but I'm guessing maybe underneath you can find uh, something that wasn't totally. <laughs> sure. I think we all have stories that stick with us, experiences sure. that replay in our head. And I have one um, from volunteer work with a museum organization that I did. Um, I helped that group do something that felt really impactful. For the first time in its 30 year history, we moved that organization's conference out of the location in which it had always been held into a location that was more accessible, that had more space for more people and helped the organization to grow. In doing so, there were people who were uncomfortable. They had been part of the organization for a long time. They appreciated the traditions around the location. So unfortunately, I found myself um, really getting screamed at across a boardroom table by a fellow board member who had potentially not absorbed what was happened, who hadn't been communicated with about all the details. And when he learned that the the decision had been made that it was happening was really deeply unhappy about it. Mm. And while I do not feel like it was appropriate for him to scream at a fellow board member, I have since thought about this situation and realized that the issue was that he wasn't bought in and maybe he was never going to agree with the decision, 
but he sh we should have had more of a conversation with him about what was happening and why so that even if he didn't agree he could respect it and we wouldn't get to a point where something like a board meeting got that contentious mm -hmm. it was a really important lesson for me in engaging your stakeholders laying the groundwork for your decisions and getting buy-in wherever it's possible yes yes doing that pre-work uh, getting your stakeholder buy-in etc the I, I lived in Japan for a couple of years and the Japanese have a great expression. It's it's called nemawashi. And that literally translates to digging around the root. Like if you're going to try to, to lift something up, you have to get work around from all angles first, do your prep work, and then you'll get it done. So that, that's a great example of nemawashi in action. Um, now, what about crucial conversations? Nobody likes to have them, those uh, maybe bad news, a difficult conversation you had to initiate or to field for that matter. How did you handle it and how did it go? So my executive director experience is in smaller institutions where as ED, I am the HR department. Mm -hmm. So I have to have the conversations around topics like performance reviews and on the job issues. During the pandemic, I actually had to lay off staff at my oh. institution because of the financial impact of the pandemic induced closure. Sure. I really hope I never have to have that kind of conversation again, but I did learn a lot in the lead up to that conversation and in the conversations themselves. Um, I had to think about how to be empathetic and compassionate, but to really um, keep in mind what the employee was going to go through in terms of losing their job in that moment and not try to make myself feel better to right. just really um, give a simple explanation of what was happening and why to ask them if there was anything they needed in that moment and to just provide pretty much the facts to keep the meetings fairly short, to keep the conversation effective, to allow space for whatever response they were going to have for that, um, but make sure that I was doing the best I could in a terrible moment um, not to foreground my own experiences and emotions. Sure, sure. And I mean, it's never easy. I'm so sorry that you had to deal with. Is there anything that you would have done differently now if you had to go back and do it over again? Uh, I, I think I did an okay job. Hopefully the employees involved wouldn't disagree with me. Again, as a transparent communicator, as much as I could during a really uncertain time, I was trying to keep the staff updated with what was going on. So I don't think that the layoffs came out of the blue. I think it would have been worse if they didn't know what was happening in the lead up to that moment. So I think if I, if we do, if I do, if our institutions do face those kinds of situations again, I would just examine what I could do to make sure staff understood what was happening at the institution that then had an unfortunate impact on them. Sure, sure. Well, here's hoping you never have to have that conversation again moving forward that none of us do for that matter. Now, let's talk about the opposite end of the spectrum, actually, as opposed to to having to lay someone off. Let's look at succession planning, promotion and additional opportunities. Can you think of something that has disqualified or, or otherwise delayed a candidate, an internal candidate for a leadership role where they were otherwise technically qualified? Is there, what would they have needed to do differently or to develop in order to show that they really were ready to lead? So as I noted for me, one of the most exciting and important parts of my job is the people that I get to, get to interact with. And for me, all of those people are important, whether it's a senior staff member, a volunteer, or a kid who's attending one of our programs for the first time. Yep. I value all of their experiences and their input. I find that volunteers actually can give some of the best input because they have an interesting spot in the institution. Um, so I did have a situation where someone wanted a promotion, wanted to move forward in a role, but I had seen some unfortunate interactions between that person and other people at the institution. And I felt like they weren't valuing feedback. They weren't valuing the contributions that people made to the organization. And that in that role, it would be really important that they did so. So I just didn't feel like putting them into that role would be good for the institution. I felt like people would feel like their input was minimized. That whole listening piece. Yes, we're mm -hmm. often we're really good at talking, not so much at listening. And it sounds like that person missed that half of the coin, that side of the coin. 
and making people feel heard and respected. You don't have to agree with everyone, but you have to make them feel like their input is valid and that you respect them as a person. Yes. Amazing. Letting people feel heard, respected, understood, valued. So many things that you would think are should be obvious. And yet it's amazing how that doesn't translate as crystal clear as we'd like to, uh, to believe that we could do. Now, let's look ahead. Future generations. My final question for you today, Allison. If you were asked to give the commencement address at a high school graduation ceremony, what advice would you give the graduates, regardless of whether they were going to go to college or not, of their career goals? What's the one thing that they'd have to do to be successful? I think I would tell the graduates of today that the world can seem like a challenging place, but as much as they can, they should make choices and move forward based on opportunity and not on fear. I think that there is so much facing today's graduates, whether it's student loan debt or the challenge of climate change or the current state of the economy and the workforce. I know that even when I was coming out of school, I was really worried about getting gainful employment and being able to establish my career. And I understand that it's a privilege to do so, but I think I would just tell them as much as they can to not be afraid to reach for opportunity, to take chances, to not always play it safe. There you go, everybody. Don't always play it safe. Take some chances, follow that passion. I love it. Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, how can people learn more about you and the Alice Paul Institute? I hope they'll visit alicepaul.org. They can sign up for our e-newsletter or browse our calendar of community programs. All right, again, the and say the website one more time alicepaul.org. There you go. And we'll put that, of course, in the show notes. Once again, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today and helping us understand more, not only about the organization and what it has in store for us, but also just about the history of women's suffrage, which I just don't think is well, under, well enough understood. Thank you, Laura. I totally agree. And to everybody else out there tuning in today, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.